The 2023 IndyCar season saw the championship dominated by Spain's Alex Palou, driving for Chip Ganassi Racing. After a consistent run of top five finishes in three of the first four races, Alex would get his first win of the season at the first visit to the Grand Prix layout of Indianapolis before finishing fourth at the 500 two weeks later. Then after that, Alex went on a tear as he would take three wins in a row at downtown Detroit, Road America and Mid-Ohio to give himself a comfortable lead in the standings. After picking up a second in Toronto and two third place finishes at Iowa and Nashville, Polo would grab one more win at Portland to win his second IndyCar title, becoming the first driver since Dan Weldon to win the title before the finale. With rumours of him potentially joining Formula 1 in 2024, this would have been the perfect way for him to end his time in IndyCar. However, this didn't happen, as due to some unkeepable promises from McLaren, combined with there not being many options on the F1 grid, on top of the fact that he wasn't getting any younger, given he turns 27 next month, Polo decided to stay in IndyCar, continuing his relationship with Chip Ganassi Racing. As a result of this, we will more than likely never see what Polo could have done in F1 if he ended up doing the switch. Had he switched to F1, there would have been people who would have been excited for Polo's debut given what he did in IndyCar. However, there are people out there who are a little bit more apprehensive when it comes to a driver switching over from the state. Now this could be attributed to the fact that on most occasions, apart from the odd few times, a driver who has switched over from IndyCar has often flopped in F1. Now there are a few examples of this, such as Michael Andretti's brief time in F1 in 1993, driving for McLaren, to Christiana Dematis' stint in F1, driving for Toyota. However, the more recent example which people will use as an example, will be the one that we are talking about today in this video. The four-time Champ Car Champion, Sebastian Bourdais. Born on the 28th of February 1979, Sebastian Olivier Bourdais always had racing in his blood. Not only because he was born in Le Mans, which is where a certain 24 hour race takes place, but also because he was born into a racing family, as his father Patrick raced for a number of years in touring cars, sports cars and even hill climbing. Sebastian began his karting career at the late age of 10, competing in various championships across France. Despite starting his career late, Sebastian showed he had a lot of speed, as during the early 90s he would win some karting titles, winning the Mont Breton League and the Cadet France Championship. In 1995, after five years in karting, Sebastian would make the transition to single-seater racing, competing in the Formula Campus by Renault and Elf, where he finished ninth before moving to the French Formula Renault Championship, spending two years in the series, where in his second year in 1997, he finished runner-up in the standings behind Jonathan Cochet, picking up four wins in the process. For 1998, he would switch to the French F3 Championship, where he would gain the Rookie of the Year award that season, finishing sixth in the standings. Sticking with French F3 for 1999, Sebastian would go even better, taking 8 wins that year to win the championship in convincing style by 31 points ahead of his French Formula Renault rival, Jonathan Cochet. During that year, he would take part in his first ever 24 Hours Le Mans, driving a Porsche 911 GT2 alongside compatriots Pierre de Foisy and James Hunt's favourite driver, Jean-Pierre Jarrier. The trio would run for 134 laps before retiring from the race with an engine failure. After 10 years competing in France, Sebastian finally made the switch to the international stage, competing for the Prost Junior team in Formula 3000, the category that was a step below Formula 1 before it was renamed to GP2 and then eventually Formula 2. In his first year in F3000, he finished 9th in the standings before moving to the Dams team in 2001 where he took his first ever win in the series at Silverstone which led to him finishing 4th in the standings, 5 places better than the previous year. Despite this however, he would once again move teams, switching to the Supernova Racing Team who had proven to be a strong force in Formula 3000, would then win the title with the likes of Vincenzo Sosperi, Riccardo Zonta and Juan Pablo Montoya. Now with a team with a proven pedigree, Bordeaux would look to take the opportunity with both hands and fight for the title in 2002. And that's exactly what he would do. 
grabbing three wins that year and also finishing on the podium in every race bar one that he finished, Borde would go on to win the Formula 3000 title by two points ahead of Giorgio Pantano. However, it's safe to say that he won the title by luck, as Thomas Enger, who was also one of his rivals that season, along with Pantano, was disqualified from the race at the Hungara Ring, which he initially won at, due to failing a drugs test, which meant that Borde was promoted onto the podium. Had it not been for the failed drugs test, Enger would have beaten Borde to the title by 5 points, but Thomas was the idiot that day for taking that substance, and Borde instead won the title. Now normally at this point, you would imagine after winning the F3000 title that Borde would be promoted to Formula 1, and it was looking like that was going to be the case, as during the 2002 season, Sebastian got his first test in an F1 car via the Arrows team and was set to drive for the team in 2003. However, throughout 2002, Arrows was going through some financial troubles and it eventually led to the team filing for bankruptcy at the end of the year after the team withdrew from the championship after the German Grand Prix. So unfortunately for Borde, he wouldn't be on the F1 grid in 2003. And despite the fact that the reigning champion of F3000 could participate in the series again the following season, unlike nowadays in Formula 2, Borde decided not to do that and instead moved to another series that was on a higher level compared to F3000. DTM Now to be fair, during this time, DTM was quite an attractive option for drivers wanting to break into F1, given the downforce levels in DTM back then were roughly similar to an F1 car. Both Paul Resta and Pascal Verlein are recent examples of this. For 2003, Borde would sign with Opal. However, he wouldn't end up driving for them, nor would he end up racing in DTM altogether, as whilst negotiating a deal with Opal, Borde's manager David Sears, owner of the Supernova racing team that Borde won the F3000 title with, was able to add a clause in Sebastian's contract, which stated that if a team in Formula 1, kart or IndyCar came knocking, Sebastian would be allowed to break his contract with Opal without having to pay any compensation. As despite what I mentioned earlier about Duresta and Verline, Borde didn't have the same hope as they did, as he believed that if he was to race in DTM for 2003, his chances of being an F1 would be over. Well, guess what happened? No, he didn't end up in F1, not yet anyway. Over in America, the Newman Haas racing team, which Nigel Mansell drove for back in 1993, were in need of a new driver lineup as a result of Cristiano D'Amata heading over to F1 with Toyota and Christian Fittipaldi making the move to NASCAR that ended up backfiring. The team would end up hiring former Williams test driver Bruno Junqueira, who moved over from Chip Ganassi Racing, and then the team would set up a three-day testing shootout at Sebring to determine who would be his teammate. Safe to say, Bruno knows all too well about testing shootouts. The shootout was set to be between two drivers, one of them being former BAR and Jordan driver Ricardo Zonta, and the other being 2001 F3000 champion Justin Wilson. However, Justin ended up pulling out from the shootout as a result of him signing with Minardi to make his F1 debut for 2003. With that being announced, it was looking like Zonta would be the guy that would partner alongside Junqueira to make it an old Brazilian lineup. However, hearing that Justin had pulled out from the shootout, David Sears ended up having a conversation with Newman Haas Racing and recommended that rather than scrapping the three day test, they should instead replace Wilson with Borde given the clause he had on his DTM contract. Newman Haas agreed to this and the three day shootout went ahead as planned. And, as you might have guessed, after impressing over the three-day test, the second seat was given to Borde, which meant that he could break out of his DTM contract with Opal. His first season in car would end up being very impressive, as in the first two races of the season, he would take pole in both of them, becoming the first rookie to take a pole position in the series since Nigel Mansell ten years prior. Despite this though, he would fail to record a top 10 finish in the first three races, with him finishing 11th at St. Petersburg and then failing to finish in the following two races. But then at Brands Hatch, his luck would change, as after leading 95 of the 165 laps, he would come through in only his fourth race to take his first ever kart win by 7.8 seconds ahead of Bruno Ginkera, making it a 1-2 for Newman Haas Racing. He would then win the following race at Euro Speedway, taking his first ever oval win before winning again a few races later at Cleveland, Ohio. 
Four more podiums afterwards would see Borde finish the year in an impressive fourth, 40 points behind teammate Shankara, who finished runner-up to that year's champion, Paul Tracy. For 2004, after the series renamed itself as Champ Car, Borde would remain at Newman Haas Racing, again partner with Bruno Junquera. And after an impressive rookie season in 2003, Borde was looking to go even better in 2004 and hoped to challenge for the title. And that's exactly what he would do. After finishing third in the first race at Long Beach, Borde would win the following race of the season at Monterey in Mexico. Then, after retiring at Milwaukee, he would win the next three races at Portland, Cleveland and Toronto. A fifth place finish at Vancouver was followed by a third place finish at Road America before taking his fifth win of the season around the Pepsi Center in Denver. Borde was on a roll throughout, but despite having the most wins that season, his teammate Shankara was keeping him honest throughout, with his results throughout the season preventing Borde from pulling away too much in the standings. A retirement at Montreal and an 8th place finish at Laguna Seca allowed Junquera to close the gap to his teammate in the standings heading into the final three races. Borde would win the following race at Las Vegas before Junquera responded with a win at the penultimate race at Service Paradise in Australia, leading to a title decider between the two teammates at the Autodromo Hermanos Rodriguez in Mexico City. Despite immense pressure from Junquera in the race, Borde kept his nerve, knowing the points gap he had to take his seventh victory of the season and with it win his first Champ Car title. It was an amazing season from Borde and one that demonstrated his raw speed and how he was able to withstand the pressure throughout the season. However, little did we know at the time that this would end up being the start of a totally dominant run, as in the three years that followed, Borde would go on an absolute tear, winning the 2005, 2006 and 2007 titles in completely dominant fashion, with 2006 being the most notable as he won the title from Justin Wilson by just under 100 points. Between 2004 and 2007, no one could stop Borde, and it was this dominant run that caught the attention of Toro Rosso. Throughout 2007, along with his campaign in Champ Car, Borde would do numerous tests with the team, with many believing that it would lead to Borde making his long-awaited debut in F1 after missing out in 2003 thanks to Arrows going bust. And thankfully for those people, it became a reality, as on the 10th of August 2007, it was announced that Borde would make the switch from Champ Car to F1, replacing Vitantoni Liuzzi at Toro Rosso and partnering alongside the talented Sebastian Vettel, making it an all Sebastian lineup at the Fianza team, even if it is spelt different. After the F1 dream looked to be dead, Sebastian was finally going to make his debut at the pinnacle of motorsport, and given what he had achieved in Champ Car, there was a lot of hype surrounding him. However, his time in F1 would end up being a disaster. The start of the 2008 season would see a major change in the technical regulations, as for the first time since Imola 2001, traction control was banned from the sport, meaning drivers had to be more patient on the throttle when coming out of corners in order to avoid losing the rear of the car. This would be no issue for Borde, as given he had raced in Champ Car the previous five years, he was used to racing in a car that didn't have driver aids. The first race of the season in Melbourne started off well for Borde, as despite qualifying down in 17th, whilst teammate Vettel qualified up in 9th, Borde was able to carve his way up through the field, taking advantage of the chaos around him to be as high as 4th in the race, one place away from the podium. However, with just three laps to go, Borde would suffer an engine failure and was forced to pull over, conceding what would have been five championship points given the point system that was used back then. However, given he had completed 90% of the race distance and given the high amount of attrition that happened in the race, Borde was classified in 8th, earning himself his first ever championship point. He would later gain an extra point by moving up to 7th as a result of Rubens Barrichello being disqualified due to leaving the pit lane whilst the red light was on during a safety car period. After a strong showing in Melbourne, people were expecting that to be the trend for Borde going forward. However, the next four races wouldn't be so kind to Sebastian as he would retire from three of the next four races with the one race he did finish out of those four being a dreadful 15th in Bahrain. 
At the Monaco Grand Prix, Toro Rosso would debut their new car after using a B-spec version of the 2007 car in the first five races. The new car was a big step forward compared to 2007, but whilst the new car was able to change the fortunes of Sebastian Vettel, who after a difficult start to the season, was able to record his first points finish of the year with 5th, the same couldn't be said for Bordet, as along with David Coulthard, who was driving for the sister team Red Bull, would crash out in wet conditions at Casino Square, making it 4 retirements in the first 6 races, which combined with his engine failure in Melbourne, meant he had only seen the chequered flag once. The next six races wouldn't fare any better, as he would still struggle to score points, with him only picking up one top 10 finish in those six races, which came at the first ever F1 race at the Valencia Street Circuit. This meant that after 12 races, Bordet had only scored two points, and hadn't scored any points since the first race of the season in Melbourne, whereas his teammate Vettel, who had adapted to the 2008 car a lot better than Bordet, and had already been confirmed to be Coulthard's replacement at Red Bull for 2009, had scored nine points, which might not sound a lot, but given the point system F1 News back then, that was still significant compared to Bordet. And it should also be worth noting that Vettel had more bad luck in the first half of the season, with him picking up two more retirements compared to his teammate. Borde needed to step up his game in the remaining races, given at this point his future in the team was at risk. And it looked like that a corner had been turned in Borde's driving at the following race, but even that race ended in heartbreak. At the Belgian Grand Prix at Spa-Francorchamps, Bordet qualified an impressive ninth, and in the race itself, was making progress through the race, moving up to 5th in the early laps, before moving up to 4th after the final round of pit stops. It was looking like, after so much frustration, that Bordet was finally going to finish strong. However, with a few laps to go, the rain that had been forecast for the race had finally made its way to the circuit, and was continuing to get harder as the laps ticked down. This saw drivers aquaplane left, right and centre, including the leaders Hamilton and Raikkonen, which led to Raikkonen crashing out of the race, putting a huge dent in his title hopes. This, as a result, moved Bordet up into the podium places, and despite the rain increasing, Bordet was keeping out of trouble, and it was looking like in only his 13th Grand Prix that he was going to take his and Toro Rosso's first ever podium. However, with just a couple of laps to go, Nick Heifeld, Fernando Alonso and Timo Glock, who ironically did the opposite in Brazil later in the season, took a gamble to switch onto the intermediate, in the hope that they could gain places in the couple of laps that was left, whilst Bordet and his teammate Vettel opted to stay out and trundle to the finish. Sadly for Bordet, the gamble of staying out didn't work, as with half a lap to go, Heifeld was able to catch both the Toro Rossos and pass the pair of them to move up to third. And then, to add insult to injury, not only would Vettel overtake Bordet, taking advantage of a mistake, but towards the end of the lap, Bordet would also get overtaken by both Alonso and Kubica. Whilst he wouldn't get overtaken by Glock, as unlike Heifeld and Alonso, the gamble wouldn't work out for him, Bordet in the space of half a lap went down from 3rd to 7th. His gamble of staying out cost him a chance of his first ever podium, and sadly for Bordet, things would not get any better. At Monza, Bordi was able to qualify a career best fourth thanks to the wet conditions, whilst teammate Vettel went on to take his and Toro Rosso's first ever pole position. However, in the race, Bordi wouldn't be able to convert the great qualifying effort, as whilst Vettel led the pack during the safety car start, Bordi's car was stranded on the grid thanks to a gear selection issue, which forced him into the pit lane. He was able to rejoin the race, but ended up finishing a lap down in 18th, whilst teammate Vettel went on to take his and Toro Rosso's first ever win. Had Borde not had his gear selection issues, who knows where he could have finished given the pace Toro Rosso showed in wet conditions. Despite the pace he showed in both Spa and Monza, the remaining races would not go down the same way, as he would fail to score in the remaining four races, once again only picking up one top 10 finish to finish the season in a disappointing 17th with only 4 points to his name, whilst teammate Vettel finished up in 8th with 35 points which led to Toro Rosso finishing 6th in the Constructors. Despite the rumours that he would be dropped at the end of 2008, Borde remained at Toro Rosso for 2009, this time partnered alongside another Sebastian, this time Boemi. For 2009, there was a big shake-up in the regulations, which saw the cars look drastically different and saw the pecking order shake up. 
Sadly for Toro Rosso, they couldn't build on the amazing season they had in 2008 and ended up with a car that on paper was the worst car on the grid. Both Toro Rossos were knocked out in Q1, with Bordé qualifying in last and Bohemi being 4 tenths quicker than him in 16th. In the race however, they were able to turn this around, as thanks to the carnage that was happening around them, including an accident involving Sebastian Vettel and Robert Kubica, the Toro Rosso pair were able to finish in 8th and 9th with Bordé just missing out on the point. However, after Jarno Trulli was disqualified from P3, which later became Hamilton, after it was discovered that he and McLaren gave false information about an overtake that happened during the safety car, which would end up being dubbed Ligate, Bordé was promoted into the final points place, meaning Toro Rosso walked away with a double points finish. Sadly though, Bordé was not able to build on that, as even though the Toro Rosso was on paper the worst car on the grid, he was constantly getting outpaced by his less experienced teammate Boemi, even if the results didn't suggest that. His relationship with Toro Rosso would continue to fracture, not helped by a start accident at Spain that Bordé caused with Boemi whilst the pair were trying to take avoiding action from Trulli and Sutil. He would grab another points finish at Monaco, once again finishing 8th, but would then finish a dismal 18th at Istanbul before retiring at the next two races, causing a silly incident with Kovalainen at Silverstone and then retiring from the Nürburgring thanks to a hydraulics issue. With nothing seemingly improving, Toro Rosso had had enough, and on the 16th of July 2009, four days after the German Grand Prix, it was announced that Borde had been released with immediate effect, with Franz Tost stating that the partnership had not met expectations. Borde received the news of his sacking via text message, and clearly not happy with this, and on the advice of his counsel, filed a lawsuit against Toro Rosso for a breach of contract, which led to Toro Rosso reaching a settlement with Borde of $2.1 million. And so, that was that. After so much promise and hype, given what he had achieved in Champ Car, Sebastian Borde's Formula 1 career was already over. So why didn't it work? After winning the title over in America for four straight years, three of which he dominated, why didn't it work out for him in Formula 1? Well, as Bordy even admitted himself, he just couldn't adapt his driving style to the Toro Rosso. Whilst he did show potential throughout 2008, despite numerous amounts of frustration and not a lot of points to show for it, when it came to the regulation change in 2009, Bordy couldn't adapt to them very well. When he was dominating in America, the car that he was driving was often catered towards his driving style, which meant he could extract the best out of himself and be able to dominate the way he did. However, when it came to Formula 1, specifically with the 2009 Toro Rosso, the STR4, Borde claimed that the car wasn't built around him, nor was it built around his teammate. The car was instead built with the onos of both drivers having to adapt to it, and this was something that Borde even admitted was not a good strength of his, and this was why when it came to qualifying, he was being constantly outpaced by his teammate Boemi, with Borde's final race at the Nürburgring being the most notable, with Boemi out qualifying him by a massive 1.3 seconds. This performance in qualifying was pretty much the cherry on top of the cake, as his relationship with Toro Rosso was already fracturing, especially with the late Dietrich Mateschitz, who during Bordet's final weekend allegedly didn't acknowledge Bordet in the paddock. Even though it wasn't too much of a surprise that Bordet was sacked, the way that the relationship ended was very unprofessional from Toro Rosso, telling him via text message rather than having a meeting with Bordet himself. Despite this though, it's fair to say that his brief time in F1 hasn't affected him, nor has it defined him as a driver. After being sacked from F1, he made a return to IndyCar, where even though he didn't grab another title, he did add a few more wins to his resume, and has also made a return to endurance racing, with him taking the GTE Pro win at the 24 Hours Le Mans with the Chip Ganassi Ran Ford team. Since then, he continues to race in sports cars, and he's still racing with Chip Ganassi Racing, this time in the hypercar class for both WEC and IMSA, which in IMSA is listed as GTP. It's such a shame his time in F1 wasn't successful, as I do feel that had the car been adapted to his driving style, he could have had a better time in F1 than he actually did. But as we know, it didn't but at least he's not allowed his time in F1 to define him as a racing driver, because even with that blip, he has proven since then that he is still a great driver.